Emily Cap, Justin Sinsley, Israel Gutierrez in his Sunday red, and Woody Page. Thursday night football, Lions at Packers. Who do you trust more? And Ronald Acuna Jr. 40 70. Something we've never seen before. Maybe never imagined was possible. This is pretty absurd. You so can't stop the game. Game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Cubs broadcast team oh, not yeah. feeling it. Mm -hmm. Let's go around the horse. That's why they lost. Uh, that is the it's reason why they lost. Got it. Who knows? Yeah. Week 18 of the NFL season last year. A thrilling finish. How Detroit got that win. They sent Green Bay home out of the playoffs. Must have been a feeling that lasted all offseason. But that was that. That was Aaron Rodgers. This is now. It's Jordan Love. And for Detroit, a hype machine the likes that we've never seen for the Lions. And they backed it up week one with that win at Kansas City. Both come in two and one with Real moments to be proud of in the short season so far. Emily Kaplan, around the horn to you. Who do you trust more? With both of these quarterbacks, Tone, I feel like the thing we talk about most is their touchdown to interception radio, like ratio. It kind of reminds me of Brock Purdy. They don't need to be spectacular. They just need to manage the ball, and they've both done a really good job of that. It's hard to tell who both of these teams are because they've been so banged up, but the two groups that are most hobbled entering this game is the secondary on the Packers and the offensive line on the Lions. And that leads me to believe that the Packers' pass rush is going to be so crucial in this one. And I'm looking at Rashawn Gary. Remember, he tore his ACL last year against the Lions, so he's back, but on a pitch count, you see him only in, like, third and fourth down situations but he's been so effective in that limited role in just 45 pass uh, rush situations he is three and a half sacks so I think he's going to be the player we're all talking about tomorrow Israel Gutierrez well Jared Goff was drafted first and Brock Purdy was drafted last I'm pretty sure Jared Goff would do really good things in that San Francisco offense but I'm also with you. I think Detroit is the team that's going to come out here. I think they're just the more consistent team. They have things more figured out right now. Offensively, 20-plus 20 po 20 points in 12 straight games. Uh, Jared Goff and his play action played the most touchdowns off play action since the beginning of last year. They have a style. Jared Goff executes it, doesn't turn the ball over a lot. We, this is technically a top-six quarterback matchup, according to QBR, through the first three weeks, but I don't have those same feelings about Jordan Love. He is getting some offensive you know, uh, players back. He is getting reinforcements in the running game with Aaron Jones, but even in the opener against the Bears, he had a big uh, pass play, but in the run play, not, a, not huge production there. So I'd like to see what the Packers can do more consistently. Right now, in a short week, I'm absolutely taking the Lions. Woody Page, around the horn to you. Who do you trust more, Packers or Lions? In Detroit, I trust, and I'd like to speak directly to Emily and her talk about the two quarterbacks. You've got one on one side who, you'll like this, Tony, since the ninth week of last year, only two quarterbacks have won 10 games. Patrick Mahomes, well, that's obvious. Jared Goff mm -hmm. is the okay. only Okay, I do like that, Woody. You got me. Quarterback wins. <laughs> yeah. So you got... You got a quarterback, Emily, on one side that completes 85% of his passes in play action. Oh, that's going to disrupt that pass rush you're talking about. On the other side, you've got a quarterback in Jordan Love that only completes 53%. Nobody does that anymore in the NFL. Tim Tebow's gone. If you are completing 50% of your passes, you're not going to have much trouble against a defense in Detroit. You know that Dan Campbell's going to fix that defense. That's his strength. So I am going with Jared Goff as the person to trust and Detroit as the team to win. Mm, rocking that yellow. A little bit of a righteous gemstone situation there for Woody. Justin Tinsley, who do you trust more, Packers or Lions? I trust the Lions more, but I want to see more consistency out of their defense. defense excuse me. Week one and week three, they look good. Week two versus Seattle, they got pushed around. And Jordan Love, he, had, he has the second worst completion percentage in football. So the, the game could hinge on guys like Aiden Hutchinson and that crew getting pressure on them. Now, offensively, of course, I'm sold. Everybody's been singing Jerry Goff's praises and for obvious reasons. Yes, 10-3 ten, ten in his last 13 st starts. A 22-3 22 to 3 TD to INT ratio. He's there. He's not a game manager. He can go out and win you a game. And Izzy just mentioned the play action touchdowns. That he, he, since the start of last season, he has 19 touchdowns uh, via play action. Green Bay is the worst at defending play action. So I, ex I, I expect to see fireworks, fireworks from Detroit tonight. Emily Kaplan back in after the horn. 
I mean, the quarterback wins. I'm not going to even address that stat. We all know that that doesn't really matter. And the only thing you guys have all mentioned is the fact that he doesn't turn the ball over. He's had one or two the last couple of weeks, but that, that is the fact right now. We've been horn. We'll move on. Dame trade 24 hours later. Let's go. Shams Tarania reporting today the offer from Miami that Portland never bid on. Tyler Hero, who would have been third to a move to a third team. Nikola Jovic, three first round picks, multiple second rounders, and swaps. Tune on that and how all this played out. The months of Miami talk, and then boom, Milwaukee. Jimmy Butler saying tampering on the Bucks part, and the Phoenix involvement and how they look moving on, and moving on from Aiton. Israel, who won, who lost? Well, the Jimmy Butler stuff just feels like humor to me, but uh, I don't feel like anybody necessarily lost. A lot of these things, obviously the Miami Heat lost. They weren't part of this deal. They were supposed to be uh, the, the front runner for Dame. They didn't get him, so that's a losing situation. But this comes down to basketball opinions. If you believe, you know, Shams reporting that Portland wanted either Jimmy or Bam as part of that trade, that's a non-starter for the Miami Heat. So, Frank, if Portland wanted that and that was their basketball decision, hey, that's the only way this makes sense for us, then you really can't argue with that, right? And when you look where Damian landed, yes, they didn't give him exactly what he wanted but they put him in a city that has a championship potential with a superstar that's probably bigger and better than uh, Jimmy Butler that last year's playoffs notwithstanding and so you can't argue with the way they treated their star guard in a situation where he wanted to be traded so you look all around and you say yeah they could have had that trade with Miami still could have gotten DeAndre Ayton they just didn't feel like that was the right trade for them whether it was them saying I don't want to send Damian to this place that he desires or not I don't know, but I doubt that they would go that route just that obviously. Did anybody hear Israel? He's not willing to say Giannis is better than Butler. He said, uh, maybe, uh, Jimmy, <laughs> you're not willing to say the word. You, you believe Jimmy Butler is better said than Butler? I said, last playoffs notwithstanding, Giannis is the better player. Oh, there it is. Now I hear it. Woody Page, who won, who lost this trade? Uh, Portland Trailblazers lost the trade. I know they got Aiden, but I've seen him in playoffs for the last couple of years, and I'll tell you what, he comes and goes. So he may be a force for them and because he's not around the Suns anymore and he wanted out, but I think the Trailblazers can win this trade as well as the other two teams if they get the right deal for Holiday. They're going to move him along, and where do they send him? To Israel's Miami Heat and try and get... <laughs> that would be a move to Miami they'd be offered. willing to do? Okay, yes, yeah. <laughs> yes. I think that if you do that and include every part of that deal that they were offering before and say, you can keep Hero, even the, we'll take everything else here. Because Tor Portland's going to take years, like the Philadelphia 76ers. This is a process again. They're going to have to just totally rebuild that team. And so I think they lost it because they gave up one of the three, four, five best players in the league, and they're going to have to just start all over again. You have Damian Lillard in the top three best players in the league? All right, uh, let's go to Emily Kaplan here. Who won, who lost this trade? I'm sorry, maybe it's my new Midwest bias, but I don't think you could look at this trade and not consider the Milwaukee Bucks the absolute winner in this. You have a superstar, the best, one of the best players in the league, I'd say top three, Giannis, who's been non-committal and saying to ownership, I don't really know if I want to sign an extension. Show me your commitment to build a winner. Okay, and they do the one thing that got us all to stop talking about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift for a couple hours. They broke the NBA <laughs> and traded for Drew Holiday. They're going to be absolutely magical together the way that, uh, sorry, not Drew Holiday, they get Dame Lillard, who's going to spread the court, spread the ball out, and unlock things for Giannis. And with the new rest rules, everyone in Milwaukee is guaranteed to see at least one of these on any given night. So this is a massive, massive win for Milwaukee. Yeah, honestly, Tony, I want to focus on the whole Drew Holiday situa situation. To me, that's the most important question in the NBA right now. We're talking about a guy who's five-time all-defense, and, that, and that's all since the 17-18 season. This is a guy who shoots 44% on catch-and-shoot threes. He's not a superstar, but, but he can change the entire for, forecast of a franchise. Give me forward. something He's, juicy. Who do you think you should know, put a play in for him? Who do you think makes sense? Let's go. Let's go around that horn. Honestly, if Boston lands Drew Holiday, they are the title favorites. I, 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 I think you put him on that team, run that team off offensively, and you give that guy – the, the defensive capabilities that he has, like, this is a, this is a legit game changer for a fran franchise. Israel, you want to address that? 
Yeah, here's the, this is the only holdup with me when it comes to Portland on this trade. They have to move Drew Holiday in order to get the assets that they want and everything else. And everybody knows that. So they're not in the greatest position for leverage here. The 33-year-old Drew Holiday, you know, aging, big contrast, etc. But there are a lot of teams, like you said, that feel like they have that finishing touch. I like Boston in that mix. Of course, the Clippers in that mix. I think he fits in really well with New York if they want to sort of take a next step. Um, and Tom Thibodeau, you know, and, and Drew Holiday, a match made in heaven. And so I, I do think that they will get a lot of offers for him because he does feel like that finishing piece for a lot of teams that have championship Emily? aspirations. Now, I feel like the obvious assumption for everyone is that he's going to go to Boston because he's an obvious replacement for Marcus Smart, and there's now this arms race in the East with the Milwaukee Bucks. But the Celtics historically have not been able to give up or have not been willing to give up multiple first-round picks to draft capita, and that's what Portland's going to want. So I look at other teams, and Brian sleeper team, honestly, is the Golden State Warriors. Why does he not fit there? I knew this was going to happen. Somebody, you have to mention Golden State. Somebody, anyone say the Lakers yet? You have to mention the Lakers. There's only three teams in the NBA. What about the Cowboys? I got enough. Israel Gutierrez, Jimmy Butler saying the check the bucks out for for tampering in this deal after the only team that had been allowed to be breathed into the air for three months was Miami. Get out of here. How do you tamper hey, on a heartbreak trade hurts. exactly? How? Get out of here. We'll be back. Heartbreak hurts. How? We say unreasonable things all the time. It's buy or sell, and buy or sell one is messy. Out for last night's Inter-Miami U.S. Open Cup final versus the Houston Dynamo. Houston winning 2-1. So a loss without Messi. It was a late call. Even the players didn't know until the last minute. Manager Tata Martino had been vague on the reasoning, acknowledging fatigue and scar tissue for Messi recently, but hasn't called it an injury and did say he wouldn't even say if it was or wasn't because he likes that competitive advantage. But of course... The not knowing led to a lot of disappointed fans and viewers when Messi didn't dress. Israel, you were there. Buy or sell into Miami's secrecy and vagueness here being the right play. Well, I'm buying it because I don't think it was any extra secrecy. I think it was just normal gamesmanship. You've got the best player in the world. The, 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 the other team is going to def, uh, prepare differently if they know he's going to play versus him not going to play. And in terms of the fans, if they just looked at what was happening here, Leo definitely wanted to play this. Miami was doing everything they could to get him to play in this game. He played against a Toronto team two games ago at the bottom of the table that he didn't have to play against and got pulled in the 37th minute, missed his next game in an attempt to play in this one. He did train for it. Just wasn't ready enough, and they made their decision. Justin Tinsley? Yeah, I'm buying it because it's the team's job to try and win games. And honestly, withholding his playing status is part of the gamesmanship. Everybody w wants to see Messi in games like, like this, including his team, especially his team. So, so it's just an unfortunate situation all around. If you're, if you're a fan, pay, paying all that money for those tic tickets, but the game is the game. I, mean, I support the team. Emily Kaplan? What I'm selling here is Miami's strategy. It feels like they're doing everything they can just to make the playoffs. They've got this grueling stretch, three games in ten days. They end the season and back-to-back -back in Charlotte, one game on the artificial turf, and they just want Messi to get there. However, if you make the playoffs, which isn't a guarantee, it's a long shot to win the thing. They just done everything they could just to get him to win this game because if they did, then you win two trophies in oh, one season. Oh, I wasn't right, following you for a second. Then the entire season is a victory. So you would have prioritized last night's U.S. Open Cup Absolutely. over making the playoffs. Woody Page, can you can you get your arms around that and also buy or sell Miami strategy? With oh, this? I'm buying what they're doing. Emily, I don't understand. So you're going to get a small cup, U.S. Cup, when you have a chance for the MLS to have Messi, the best player in the world, in the playoffs with at least a chance to win a real title and a real cup instead of what happened last night. I think it makes sense for them to protect him and try and go for the playoffs. Israel, can you answer that question? Would you rather have prioritized last night and a cup or this playoff run they hope to go on? Yeah, uh, Inter Miami is prioritizing this cup, it's prioritizing the chance to win a cup that's been around since 1914, by the way. Uh, it's very old and very, uh, very uh, thought highly of. And so, yeah, I think they were looking at Leo to play in this game. The things that have to go right, not just for you to make the playoffs, but then to win in the playoffs, it's a lot, it's a lot to think about. And so if you just have to win this one game in front of you for your second trophy in three months, that's absolutely something they were prioritizing. Buy or sell two, 4070 for Ronald Acuna Jr. Baseball history in Atlanta last night. And listen how irked Cubs broadcasters were when they stopped the game for a tribute to Acuna next inning. 
This is pretty absurd. I mean, it, it's just a hell of an accomplishment. Totally, but you but can't stop the game yeah, and a yeah, highlight yeah. montage. I can't imagine this is going over real well in the Cubs dugout. They can stop the game. They did stop the game. Cubs, of course, it means everything for them to get some wins here in this very tight wild card race. But yet again, the Cubs blowing another game to Atlanta. And this is where we are. But Woody, for starters, buy or sell a tribute and a stoppage for 4070. I'm sell I'm buying the achievement, but I'm selling the stoppage. You don't stop this show every time I set a new record here uh, <laughs> for number of wins. And the Cubs obviously were not paid attention to. They lost the game, but again, they had been playing poorly. But it wasn't sportsmanship or fair to them to stop the game. And he's going to hit more home runs and steal more bases this year. Stop the game in the last game, which doesn't mean anything. Emily Kaplan? Okay, let's just pause. This is an absolutely massive achievement. Some people say, oh, well, the bases are bigger this year. It's easier to steal bases. Mm. No, then why is nobody else particularly mm. close? This is incredible. That said, this is game 158. It has playoff consequence. In fact, the next at-bat was one of consequence. In a year where we're talking about pace of play, it is outlandish that they paused for this montage of highlights. I'm with Boog in the booth here. All right, so you're selling as well. Justin Sinsley stopping the game for that 4070 tribute. Oh, forget it. I'm buying it. He was the first to 40-50. He was the first to 40-60. He's the first to 47, 47, so, excuse me, 40-70. Anytime you create a metric of dominance and he scored, when he broke the scoring title in the NBA, it just seemed like a bit much at the moment. Oh, it's an amazing image, though, when you pull that, that base out of there, because it's just like Ricky Henderson when he did it. Yeah. Hey, Emily, I'm, I'm glad you brought up that some people think the stolen bases is not a big deal because the bases are bigger. That was Bill Plasky when he said Mookie Betts should be MVP of the season in his FaceTime earlier this week. He's not here now, but he said Betts for MVP in a text to me. And feel free to rip Atlanta for stopping the game yesterday with that <laughs> Terrible, nutsy video tribute. That's Bill Plasky chiming in from the top rope. Never change, Bill. We'll move on. Fire or sell three. Speaking of celebrations, well, this is a big game also between the Mariners and Astros. And the Astros got back on the winning streak to get this win. But here it is, a celebration for a strikeout. We know batters like to celebrate home runs. Well, here it is, Hector Neris feeling that K of Julio Rodriguez. And the bench is cleared for his reaction. Justin, buy or sell a celebration for a strikeout. I'm not only buying it, I'm purchasing equity in it. These are two teams with a lot at stake. They're in the same division. There was a lot on the line in this game. Emotions are part of the game. To hell with these unwritten rules. I love these celebrations. No, I love the celebration. This was more intimidation. This was wagging the finger in somebody's face versus wagging it to the crowd. I don't mind celebration. Just don't go directly at the batter. Woody like Page? Uh, I'm selling the celebration. If you want to do that, stay on the mound. Don't leave your lane. Don't go to a different <laughs> place and start. All right, so on the mound, he can moonwalk and split and do a full-on dance. <laughs> or, Emily Kaplan. Yeah. There's only one way to solve this. Pause the game, give both of the guys some boxing gloves, let the umpires watch them duel it out for 45 Whoa. seconds, let everyone let off steam. It works in you, 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 you just said don't pause the game in your last answer. The, the pitch clock was so important, you had a problem. 45 with the, seconds. Hmm. For 45 seconds. But it's for seconds. another sport. Hmm. Just to let off steam. There is history you. between Harrison oh, and Rodriguez. Rodriguez, Cadillac, the home run. He had off him last year. Clearly, that was part of it. Woody Page, stay in your plasma if you're going to celebrate your third place finish today, all right? Just stay in the plasma. Get out, Emily. Gutierrez Kaplan, showdown next. Tony Watson, stay safe. 30 a.m. Eastern, 1030 Mountain Woody. Who stayed up? Practice round today, Victor Hovland, a hole in one and a par four. That's an albatross. U.S. hasn't won on European soil in the last six cups there. That's 30 years. Israel, Emily. Good luck in showdown. Oh, you got it, Rome, Israel. Um, I'm going to go with the Europe team. I know the U.S. has the advantage in terms of higher-ranked players, but to me, Ryder Cup is always a vibes thing. I just don't feel it with the U.S. Uh, Spieth and Thomas aren't even playing in the first session, and they're buddies. And I think Roy McIlroy, I know it's Italy, not Ireland, but I think Roy McIlroy leads Europe to a win. Emily Kaplan. 
You know who's feeling himself? Brooke Kepka, who's already been booed in intros. There is no player on the circuit as competitive as him, thirsty for blood. He's the only live golfer to make it. He wants to get everybody. He's so competitive. I think he's going to drag the U.S. to a win. All right, there we go. But you got to stay up to watch. You got to get up at 1.30 in the morning or, or, or go to late night. Yeah. We'll move on. More on celebrations. Tampa last night was a well-executed alternative to celebration. They clinched a week ago, but they lost that game. So this was a scheduled celebration 10 days later in Boston. But they scheduled it a week plus later because they have an off day tomorrow so they can really enjoy it and sleep in. Emily, where do you come down on delayed celebrations? Yeah, I like this. I always feel bad for a guy who like scores his first goal and the team loses and then he's really awkward in the locker room. Plus, I appreciate a team that always still gets after it. It's not like they're going to go home and play Fortnite. Maybe they just want to rest up so that they can stay up tonight for the Is live golf. Oh, sorry, Ryder golf. This makes no sense to me. They just planned a night out. Like, the celebration part in the locker room doesn't have anything to do with the rest of your night. You could have done that after you clinched and then just gone home. I'm all right, though, with the idea of scheduling a clinching so you're not doing it after a loss. We, we saw Milwaukee do that this week. It, it's better that way. Point, game, FaceTime. Israel, don't celebrate. You lost. Emily Kaplan, 30 seconds. The hockey world is heartbroken right now. Chris Snow, the assistant general manager of the Calgary Flames, a former sports writer, he's not expected to recover after going into cardiac arrest after his battle with ALS. Chris's strength, his determination through his battle has inspired us all, and his wife, Kelsey, was so raw and vulnerable sharing that journey and reminding us all that it's okay to say that things are hard. So Kelsey and her family, everyone who met Chris, I can promise you we will never forget him. Thank you for that time, Emily. Our thoughts with the family and with the team. We're on a 23 and a half hour break. We'll see you tomorrow around the horn.